everybody, and welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Anais Sim, and today we have Raphael with us, who is the founder of the Toucan Protocol. Toucan is building Web3 building blocks for a regenerative economy. In today's episode, we're going to dive deep into what that actually means, why it's important, and more generally, how crypto can help combat climate change. So thank you so much for joining us today, Raphael. How are you doing? Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, we were catching up a bit before this. And something that I had said to you that is always a good sign to me is when people who aren't in this space mention projects within it. And I have some friends who are not in crypto and who are really interested in climate tech in particular. And Toucan was something that they kept on referencing. So super excited to dive into it with you today and learn more myself as well. <laughs> I was really excited to hear that, right? Because the climate space and the Web3 space are still quite far from each other. So yes, we're building a bridge also from a technical point of view, but the most important bridge that we need to build is an educational bridge. And that this is why I think like podcasts like these are super, super important. Yeah, 100%. So where I want to start with you is ReFi. I know that Toucan is a project that exists under the broader ReFi umbrella. This is a term that some people are familiar with, others are not. It's still, you know, a pretty niche subset. So could you just explain what ReFi is and maybe also speak to the importance of it? Sure. So I don't claim to be the god of ReFi and be able to give you a perfect definition. I think there's probably multiple definitions that float around. So I can give you my my take on it, maybe as a bit of a backstory. So I remember like some of the first presentations that we did with Toucan when we were still called CO Toucan. We tried to coin the term Decleify for decentralized climate finance. And it's horrible. So when I saw the word refi popping up, and I do think it came from like the Cosmos ecosystem, it was either Sean Conway or maybe Gregory Landwehr from Region Network, I think. So somewhere there, I saw it and it just made instant sense. And I was like, yes, like refi is so like, it's much more elegant than, than Decleify. So what I understand on the refi is really building on the tools that the whole DeFi, you know, the DeFi train has, has given us and using these tools for building a regenerative economy, right? So what that means for me personally is that most of our economic system is based on extraction and most of our money is also based on extraction, right? We talk about the petrodollar and these kind of things. So the idea behind ReFi is that we can build a system, financial system that by design, puts back, right? It puts back into uh, our carbon sinks. It puts back into increasing biodiversity, making sure that like water cycles are better and like not fucked up. So for me, it's about using the tools at hand to embedding regenerative practices into the fabric of the new economic system that we build and this new financial system that is evolving on chain, right? So in my dream scenario, DeFi and ReFi are not two different things. But by plugging on regenerative ideas and processes onto the existing infrastructure in DeFi, you know, we're going to basically eat up what DeFi is and turn it into ReFi, right? Because I do think if you want to make DeFi the backbone of our new financial system, it will need to address the challenges that we have in this generation. And for me, climate change is one of the biggest challenges that we have, including, you know, next to some like biodiversity loss, etc. But most of our problems have to do with like nature and how we treated it. So making sure that the financial system of the future works in line of the planetary boundaries or within the planetary boundaries, that's what refi is for me. So essentially you're saying like embed these regenerative practices into code in, in a broader sense, like it offers us an opportunity to experiment with how money relates to value and what we are ascribing value to. 100%, right? To make it a bit more tangible, right? So what does that mean? So imagine when you do a Uniswap transaction, there's a small transaction fee, right? That either is opt-in or even prescribed by the protocol where a slight, a small portion, such a small portion that you don't even really realize that it's there, goes towards burning carbon credits, so retiring carbon credits, which ultimately drives finance to projects on the ground. We are moving on to, we're launching um, Tukin now on Celo also. And what's interesting about Celo is that they have a stablecoin protocol called Mento. 
And basically, it's the, it's the system that runs behind the CUSD and the C-Euro, etc. So these are stable coins that are packed to the dollar and the euro. And in their reserve, they have a goal to reach 40% natural capital currencies, of which carbon is the most prominent one. So the idea that we can actually back money with the things that we actually care about as a society, turning carbon into not just a, an accounting tool to balance you know, your negative externalities, but actually turning it into a form of value that we can use to back the money that we use every day, right? And then you can actually vote by the money that you use, right? So it will make a difference whether or not you choose to use a certain stablecoin over another, because by choosing one stablecoin, you actually indirectly support the development of renewable energy, you support the regeneration of forests and like coastal areas, etc. Versus the other one, you don't, right? Also, Rune from, from MakerDAO has put out like a great post of like clean money and how we can actually use money to drive the change that we want to see in the world. So on that line of thinking, drive the change that we want to see in the world. Obviously, like you're committing a lot of your career to this cause. Why was the climate crisis something that was really important for you to go after? And I guess part two of that question is why start with carbon markets? So the first question, I don't know, it's, been, it's always been there. I grew up in a small town in southern Germany called Tübingen, which is quite for think it has it's a university city we have a, a mayor from the green party since like ever basically so i would say that like climate change has always been very present here yeah so i i, I, I there was not like one moment where i woke up and was like oh my god this is what i want to do it was kind of like when i was done with, with with school it was clear that i wanted to work in this so i actually studied engineering energy engineering so more from like the technical point of view renewable energy work storage systems, photovoltaic, wind, solar, etc. So that was my background. And then I got down the crypto rabbit hole back in 2017, like so many. And I was first really excited about the use case of using Web3 as a backbone to renewable energy markets or like local energy markets. So I actually built a small kind of energy trading system based on Hyperledger Fabric, which is been an experience. Everybody who's used have Ledger Fabric will know what I mean. It was impossible to get more than 16 nodes to sync. But anyways, it was a good way for me to really understand why public blockchains are the way to go. Uh, so, you know, if you're, if you're honest, the whole energy transition is all about carbon transition, right? It's a transition away from using fossil fuels to power our economy and like make a transition towards like clean energy. So, when I got really interested in DAOs, it was in 2019, and I was looking at the climate crisis, and I was like, hey, we have, we're building all these coordination tools here on this side you know, of the open web, and climate change being the biggest coordination failure that we have. I was like, hey, why not try to apply those tools that we all have to address the climate crisis? And then, you know, I went to a hackathon. I went to East London in February 2020 with the idea of launching a project called CO2CAN, which was the hackathon name behind 2CAN. And then the journey began, really. The project kind of developed its own pace, and I was just running with it, right? We did the blockchain for social impact incubator later, and then I joined a, a venture builder in London called Deep Science Ventures, which is very like tech-driven, like deep science-driven also, where I really you know, had the chance to be able to look at the first principles behind these problems, really drill down into this intersection between Web3 and climate and like what are the tools that we can use to address some of these and really looking for like the the one leverage point, the, the first thing that we need to do that will unlock a lot of other things. And that's how we landed on Tukan actually, or back on Tukan, because the idea behind Tukan is really very similar to, you know, how DAI unlocked DeFi maybe, right? So like how stablecoins really made it possible to come up with all these crazy things that we have now. And I believe that carbon tokens are essentially just a door opener towards breaking up this broader space. And I do think that this thesis got proven right because when KlimaDAO launched and uh, Token was the infrastructure on which KlimaDAO was built, essentially, or like the, for, for the, the, the carbon component of it, the amount of hype that was created around this you know, it really demonstrated what you could do with carbon tokens once they are programmable, right? And once they become a building block. This is, I would say, our biggest mission at Tukan is allowing the builders to build with a new money Lego, a carbon money Lego, right? And 
be it you know projects building in the metaverse using carbon tokens to plant trees in the metaverse that you know sequester carbon in the real world or uh, you know using it in nfts and like you know to embed this in like nft marketplaces or create art nft based art that like puts money back into projects or stablecoin protocols for back using this or using like lending markets transfer like the we're still super early in this but Essentially, the premise behind Token is that by unleashing the creativity that we have in Web3 on this problem, which is the climate problem, I think there's a really good chance that something amazing is going to happen. And it doesn't necessarily have to come from us. It will probably not come from us. It will come from some group or somebody building on us to have an idea that like is massive. And then you ask why carbon? Carbon is an imperfect proxy for environmental health. And this is one of the reasons why we change the name from co 2 can to actually just Toucan Protocol because, you know, at the end of the day, this is about environmental assets. And carbon is just the most, of all environmental assets, carbon is the most developed or like from a market perspective, there is actually a market, there is demand. The market is broken and we can go into that later, but the market is broken, but at least there's kind of like the, the first components are there, right? So I don't think this is, you know, this problem is solved if we only solve the climate, the the carbon problem, not at all. But it is, you know, as every project needs to focus in the beginning, we have limited resources and just carbon seemed like the most logical place to start. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I like what you're saying, too, about, you know, this could be the first domino in a string of dominoes to really like light this refi movement forward. I want to get a bit deeper into how Toucan actually operates because I think it's fascinating. But before that, to set context here for listeners who like may not be as familiar with how the carbon offsetting markets operate at a high level, can you describe that process? Sure. So, this is quite a complex thing. So I'll try to like start at the high level and get more granular. So there's different types of carbon markets. There is generally what we call the compliance carbon market, which is the European emission trading system is, is one of those. There's a trading system in California as well. So these are mostly government type actors that will regulate the amount of carbon that can be emitted within a certain zone, certain economic zone, and then give out uh, emission allowances, so a right to pollute, and they basically over time reduce the amount of allowances that they give out to put the pressure on the industry within that certain uh, economic zone to reduce their emissions. That's one tool to essentially put a price on carbon. And then there's a, what is called the voluntary carbon market. And the voluntary carbon market started back in the 90s and has been developed over the last you know 30 years probably now. And the voluntary carbon market is, as it says in the name, it's it's based on voluntary emission reduction. So essentially, whenever you buy you know a, a plane ticket and there's like this question, hey, do you want to offset your footprint? Th- then you are interacting with the voluntary side of this market. And it's not based on emission allowances. It's based on actual projects on the ground that will either reduce, avoid, or remove emissions from the atmosphere, right? So this is everything from renewable energy projects, cook stove projects that displace the use of like a lot of wood in the cooking process, uh, mangrove projects like reforest or restore mangrove, forestry projects, soil carbon projects, direct air capture projects, which are really like, you know, big machines that suck carbon out of the atmosphere. So there's a pretty broad range of projects that are essentially, you know, addressing the carbon problem. And then there's, third-party verifiers, which are often called carbon standards, which make sure that these projects are following a specific process, a set of rules. It's called a methodology. It's kind of a recipe that you need to follow in order to be granted these carbon credits after your project has been monitored, right? So the flow is here, you know, you have a bit of land that you want to regenerate. You will pick your methodology, you will pick your standard, then you will write a project design document that outlines what you want to do, how you're going to go about it, what's the baseline emissions that you have. And then, you know, there's an auditor that is going to, you know, check those documents, that is going to uh, make sure that this is all sound. And then you're going to start working the land, planting trees or whatever your intervention is. And then after two, three, four years, you're going to do a monitoring session, 
there's this third party auditor that's going to check that the data that you provided is correct. And then the carbon standard is the body that will issue you carbon credits. And then what you normally do is that you sell those carbon credits to intermediaries because the market is super opaque and the supply side and the demand side rarely meet. So there's a big, big amount of intermediaries in the middle, like resellers, brokers, or retailers that are buying directly from projects and then selling this to the end customer, which can be corporates, which can be individuals, uh, et cetera. And one of the problems is that those intermediaries take 40 to 60% of the value that is sent to these projects. So this is carbon finance that doesn't actually result in carbon finance. And there's multiple reasons for why that is the way it is, but this is one of the problems that we're tackling with Tugin, essentially. Okay, so... This is a bit new to me, so (laughs) stay stay with me here. So basically, let's say I'm a project that produces a lot of CO2 emissions. I know I'm not contributing in a helpful way to the environment. So I want to buy or sell carbon credits. So if you're a project that is emitting a lot of carbon, then you're on the buying side. Then you're a polluter. And polluters can buy voluntary carbon credits to basically offset their negative externality, right? So your pollution is a negative externality on the planet. And the first thing that you should do if you're a polluter is reduce your emissions. So buying carbon offsets is not an excuse or not an alternative to actually first and foremost reduce your emissions. So, you know, if you take Ethereum as as an example... Ethereum was working on proof of work, so it was one of the biggest polluters in the world. Now Ethereum is moving to proof of stake. So this is the first duty of every polluter is to find an alternative solution to the status quo that dramatically reduces its emissions. So you could say that Ethereum, from that perspective, has done the first step towards doing the right thing. Now, a next step is that, you know, if you stay on this example of Ethereum, there's still emissions associated with running the network. And there's also historical emissions that are associated with like the proof of work history of Ethereum. So in that context, Ethereum could purchase voluntary carbon credits from projects that are planting trees so that are producing positive externalities. They're actually reducing uh, the amount of emissions in the atmosphere and basically compensate their negative externality, their carbon footprint, by buying up positive externalities. So I would say this is how this is the status quo of this market. So you have polluters on the one side, and then you have projects that draw down carbon or remove or avoid or reduce the amount of emissions. And the market is basically, I do something good, I do something bad. The people who are bad, they finance the people who do something good. And the carbon credit really is just a vehicle. It's a results-based finance mechanism that just pays for a proven reduction of emissions. It's, it's just to make sure that you find these emission reductions that have already taken place. It's just a tool to move money from A to B. Okay, it's a tool to move money from A to B, which makes sense why it's such a productive vehicle on the blockchain. 100%. And I think there's a lot of challenges with carbon credits, right? And a lot have to yeah, do with Yeah, let's the... get into that. So what are the issues? So we met, we kind of glossed over a couple of them while you were describing that. But like, what are the issues with the voluntary carbon markets as they stand today? And then how is blockchain technology in a better place to be able to help solve some of those? Yeah. So I would say one of the key problems that this market has is the lack of transparency, right? And the lack of transparency has a bunch of like follow-up problems. So one of the problems is there's no price discovery, right? So there's no transparency about transactions that are taking place. There's no liquid market for carbon credits. They're very much traded like, you know, NFTs. You have to think of them as like each project's credits is like an NFT that has a set of attributes and properties that will define its value in the market and its price and its rarity. And, you know, it's like very, very similar. But there's no open seat for carbon credits, right? So what happens is that these intermediaries are making use of that opaqueness in the market to charge a pretty safety premium on the credits that they buy from credits and that they sell to corporates. Sometimes it's even justified because those intermediaries, they do an important job, which is they curate, right? They curate whatever comes from the supply side and sell it to the demand side. But that curation again, is not always super transparent. 
And so ultimately, it's a lot about building a brand that radiates legitimacy and then, you know, finding the right balance between using your brand value to sell carbon credits that might not actually meet certain standards. So that's one of the problems. Price discovery, on the other side, is also a problem when you talk about the project finance, right? So when a project starts, it needs somebody to put money on the table and be like, look, I give you a loan or I buy those credits as forwards from you. But in absence of a clear market signal, what these credits that this project is producing will be worth in the market or is even currently worth in the market, the bankability of these projects is really low, right? So projects generally have a harder time getting debt finance. One of the biggest problems is in the MRV space. So MRV stands for Monitoring, Reporting and Verification. And that's the part where somebody is checking up on these projects, is making sure that they are legit, that there's no fraud happening, that you know all the reports are in line, etc. And then that's where it's not very, very clear sometimes what's, what's happening, right? And so there's projects that have flawed baselines. So the baseline is basically, you know, you start the project, you measure the baseline, which is basically the status quo, and then you start the project, which is the intervention. And the difference between the baseline and the intervention is what you will get as carbon credits, right? So let's say you have a piece of land that suffers from deforestation. You will go ahead and you'll say the rate of deforestation in this area is like 10% a year. And so in whatever, five years' time, like half of this land is going to be gone. And I will now come in and I will intervene and I will make sure that no deforestation happens here. And then, you know, I get carbon credits for the difference. And then there's problems around this that have to do with leakage. So what if the deforestation increases in other areas? And it's not like the standards are trying to incorporate that into their methodologies. And there's, I would say, generally speaking, an improvement that is happening. But this whole process is still super manual. It relies on a few appointed auditors that often fly there to really like check up on the projects. Often the project developers and the auditors also know each other. And, you know, there's basically the level of trust, I would say, is relatively low on, on that level. And so carbon credits are intangible assets, right? We're dealing with an asset that essentially is made up. Or it's not made up, but like it's not something that you can eat. It's not something you can touch. It's, it's really a carbon credit represents a reduction of emissions so it's really a bunch of data that is put into reports with some stamps of approval on top of it. And that's what makes up the carbon credit. And that credit currently lives in a database that is maintained by the standards and just sits there as a database entry, right? And it's not really a financial asset in, in, the, in that sense. So what Web3 can do, first of all, it can bring these assets onto a public ledger, onto an immutable system, to make sure that there's no double issuance, no double counting. It can make it easier to back these credits up with data. So really link the raw data directly to the token, allow the projects to you know, tell a story around those and link it directly to the token, and ultimately turn these carbon credits into financial assets, right? So the difference between a database entry and a financial asset is that from a financial asset, you can use it as collateral, you can borrow against it, or you can earn yield. If you imagine the amount of money that is currently sitting in carbon assets, because there's corporates like hedge funds and a lot of different actors that are hedging on the price of carbon because they believe that the price of carbon is going to go up. So they are holding their long carbon, but they cannot actually leverage that position. They cannot, you know, borrow against it or something like that. So, you know, that, that's where I see the use of, you know, Web3 really like coming in and ultimately developing more and more projects on the ground. So making sure that forward finance is kind of embedded into the life cycle making sure that we can make sense of these projects, that the data on these projects is accurate, that the global society can actually check up on and make sure that these projects are doing what they're supposed to do, etc. Yeah, mind blown. I think what could be helpful here is that was a great overview. And then maybe now transitioning into like what Toucan is doing in this space, how it operates. And I'm sure that will reference a lot of the points that you just made as well. Sure. So... One of the key ideas behind Toucan, as I said earlier, is really to unlock the builders, right? So in order to unlock the builders to build with carbon assets, what our premise was to work with the existing supply of carbon credits. 
So this means working with the existing standards like Vera, like Gold Standard, which are basically the, the big names in the room currently that control this voluntary carbon market. So Vera is around 70% market share in, in the voluntary carbon market. So what we did is we basically built a bridge that allows any holder of Vera carbon credits today to turn them into a token. A token that is is essentially just a digital twin of that carbon credit. So it has the same attributes, right? Think of it, if you have a carbon project from Brazil that is a reforestation project from 2015 it, with methodology ABC, et cetera, basically create a token that is an exact copy of that, including all these attributes. So that's the first step, really, is basically we take this, what's called the carbon registry on, on the, the real world, and we just build an, a bridge that allows people to move those over onto the blockchain. And now we have, in the in the token system, they're called TCO2 tokens, right? So tokenized or, or token carbon offset tokens. Now, as I said, price discovery is one of the issues. So we've built another tool, which is called Carbon Pools, which essentially allow projects with similar or carbon tokens with similar attributes to be put into a single pool. Right? So it's maybe a bit like NFTX. I've been living in Berlin for 10 years, so you think you know, think of it a bit like a club where you have a bouncer that has an agenda, right? So we have a carbon pool that's the nature-based carbon pool, for instance. And the nature-based carbon pool at the door, it differentiates between are you a nature-based project or not, right? So essentially the bouncer, their job is to make sure that like no non-nature-based projects get 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 to the pool. So now Let's say you have five different credits. You know, one is from Brazil, one is from Colombia, one is from Congo, one is from Indonesia, one is from China. And they're all nature-based projects. So they can all go into the nature-based carbon pool to mint what's what's called the NCT, the nature-based carbon ton. And now we have suddenly a very liquid asset because we have something, we've created something like a carbon commodity for a specific subgroup, a specific sub-element of the carbon market. And that cannot go onto a decentralized exchange that can go into lending protocols like Aave or, you know, it can go as collateral into the seller reserve or into MakerDAO or whatever, right? So essentially, we're bundling multiple credits from a diff- from different family into a single pool. The interesting aspect is that you can go back, right? So the pool token really is a, it's a coupon that lets you redeem any of the underlying carbon credits again, right? So... And that's important because when you retire these credits, which is the end state of any carbon credit, is to like basically burn it and claim the underlying environmental value for yourself. You want to be able to you know, tell a story about how you supported the project in Brazil because maybe your supply chain is based in Brazil or you have some friends there and you want to support projects. That, right? whatever, whatever reasons you might have to point out a specific project, you can basically use those pools, right? So there's liquidity for the broad family, and then you can still use that NCT to redeem for any of the underlying TCO2 tokens that are in the pool, and then burn the TCO2 and say, look, I supported a specific project in a specific part of the world. So that's probably broadly the state of the, of the protocol right now. I just want to make sure I have this right. Sure. So... You guys don't own the carbon. Yes. You don't transact no. it. You're just an infrastructure provider. Yes. So basically, you connect to legacy carbon registries and you provide the ability for the holders of these carbon credits to tokenize them and bring them on chain. And then these people get certificates and you're creating pools of these tokens. And the reason why the pools are important is because there's different standards attached to these tokens so you these pools are meant to create an asset that is able to be commoditized more efficiently and again this goes back to our earlier point about the issues of achieving price discovery in the carbon markets and this is one of the first steps to be able to do that is that a correct summary perfect yes okay Okay. (laughs) and so as you said we're not in the business of selling carbon Right, like we are an infrastructure provider, and the pools that that are live on token. There's right now there's two pools. There's the base carbon pool and the nature based carbon pool. The base carbon pool has been designed by Kimadao, and 
to fit their theory of change that they had launched to sweep the floor, right? So that was the idea of like buying up the kind of lowest quality spectrum of the carbon supply to force polluters to buy into, you know, to move, first of all, to move the price of carbon up for everybody and force polluters to purchase the better credits. I guess the flip side of that, though, is would some people say then that that also incentivizes people who are producing lower standard carbon credits? Yes. And I do think that in hindsight, that theory of change was proven wrong. And that basically, you know, that I think Klima would have been better served with a higher quality carbon asset in their reserve rather than like following that sweep the floor, sweep the floor narrative. So the nature-based carbon pool, for instance, has been designed by a coalition between a region network, MOS, which is uh, also a, a project from Brazil, and Tucan also, which so really we're trying to make these pools into like community run pools and that anybody can essentially launch a pool on Tucan, right? So we essentially, it's a bit like SushiSwap or Uniswap or whatever. It's like, we want to get to a point where people can actually use our infrastructure to launch their own pools to also connect their own sources of supply, right? So again, right now it is a bridge to Vera, but we want to be able to, you know, if, you, if you're if you like an up, up and coming registry or up and coming standard um, and you have a new way of doing things and there's no established way yet on how to do so, we want to make sure that we build the infrastructure that will empower you to bring those credits on as like, you know, essentially to make use of the immutability of a blockchain to create a ledger of like the state of the carbon world, essentially. And then who's creating, sorry, who's creating the standards for those pools then? Is it customizable by project or like who's regulating that part of it? So the standards for the pools or the standards for the projects that like get onto Duken? Well, sorry if I'm misunderstanding this, but what I thought was that like the pools are composed of these different carbon credits that have similar attributes. standards. So it's, or, it's not similar standards, yeah, it's similar, attributes, similar attributes, right? So we call them, okay. we call them, you know, a pool has a certain set of gate, a gating criteria, right? So, and this can be anything, right? This can be, we only accept credits from, you know, a certain time frame, right? Only credits that are like from 2012 onwards or um, whatever. We only accept credits that are from South America because we want to create a South American carbon pool. We only accept credits that follow a very specific methodology. So for instance, we're like in the works of launching a mangrove pool. So a mangrove pool only allows a very specific subset of regeneration projects to be put into there. So the logic that you can apply to the creation of the pool is pretty wide based on a whole list of attributes, right? So similar, like, look, you know, you have all the all the crypto punks and then you basically, you draw circles around them. You can say, okay, all the crypto punks that like, you know, are smoking a cigarette, you put them into that pool, right? So it's a bit like that logic. So there's a very, there's a curation aspect right here. There's a curation aspect where somebody comes in and says, look, we, you can even say, you know, we provide a specific list of projects that we have access to satellite data and maybe drone footage that like gives us a very high degree of confidence that these projects here are right and like doing a good job. And we have, you know, data that shows that these projects are not doing a good job, right? So you could actually use those, those the data to curate the list of projects that you want to you know, whitelist and allow into a pool. And the idea is really to like open this up, right? And the buying behavior, the buying side of carbon credits is quite diverse. Mm, okay, that's that's an interesting point. And I kind of want to get into that. So Tucan is providing the infrastructure and then projects like Dow are building on top of Tucan and essentially like providing a marketplace or a liquid aggregator. So I'm sure you have opinions about this. So I want to hear it. We're talking a lot about price discovery and how it's important for carbon credits to be able to achieve that. And again, like in this broader scheme of refi, that allows us to import our values into the money that we're transferring between each other. So where do you think these largest buy side participants will be coming from? Do you think that's going to be individuals, corporations? Is it going to be a more Web3 native organization like a DAO? What are your thoughts here? So... I do think that we are at a very interesting point, right? Because we are in the midst of a bear market. So the good thing about where we are right now is that we have to solve real problems of real people. And we don't have, you know, magic money to throw at something and make it look like there's product market fit. When I started this, to be very honest, I thought, wow, like, let's 
bring carbon to crypto and like, you know, this is a new market for carbon credits. It's like you can do new things. My vision has completely changed since like in the last three years where I'm like, no, 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 we're actually, this is the foundation on which the future of environmental markets need to be built, right? So we, we have an opportunity to leapfrog directly from like a web one carbon market to a web three based carbon market. And I don't think we want to stop at web two. There's really no need to. And so our approach with Tukin is really like we're building stuff for the real world, which is why I was really excited to hear that, you know, you have friends that are not in the crypto bubble that know about it because by solving problems of like real people and, you know, at the end of the day, this is finance that is supporting real people that are creating meaningful change on the ground. Like we have to make sure that we're doing something for on that level, right? On the buying side, I do think that the traditional market still needs to be one of the largest buyer and, and will be one of the largest buyer in the short to medium term, right? However, I do think that crypto as a community has responsibility, right? Because we're built on tech that is quite dirty, right? Like Bitcoin is dirty. Ethereum is still dirty. It's going to get better. And I do think that, as I said earlier, like Web3 is all about like coordination tools. And I think, you know, that's where smart contracts do best. So I really do think that, and I hope that the Web3 community is really rising up to the challenge and that DAOs are going to, you know, divest into carbon assets, not just because it's philanthropy, but just because it's a sound asset to park your money in, right? Because in a bear market, inflation is going crazy on like US dollars, etc. So like if we can create a mature carbon market where the Web3 and the Web2 world is are well connected, so it's like not just providing value within a free Web3 environment, then I do believe that natural capital assets will become a very, very sound financial asset also for DAOs and protocols to like hold on your balance sheets. And I do think we need to get to that level of uh, financialization in order to unlock the amount of capital that is needed to solve the climate crisis fast enough, right? Because we have to put trillions into these projects. And right now, the infrastructure is not there to deliver that amount of finance in an efficient way and to make sure that this money is, you know, creating actual impact on the ground. So this is my hope for, for building a Web3 based carbon market and environmental markets in a broader sense. Snaps yeah. to that. No, really. <laughs> if you work in a DAO or you're building a new project, it's surprisingly easy now to do the right thing because it's just a few lines of code. We've written auxiliary smart contracts that, you know, bundle all these complex transactions into one thing. We're building an SDK. So we're really trying to make it as easy as possible for people to just build your product and just make sure that it's kind of like, it has that covered as well, right? Like if you're building a new protocol, why not think about like putting 1% of all the, the proceeds or like of the transaction fees, just put that into like burning carbon credits. And like, then you have a planet positive protocol. How cool is that? So, and I think we can really show the existing world that crypto is not just about pump and dump. It's really about real change. And I think that this gives us a really good and easy way to, to, to prove that. Mm, I totally agree. Something that like originally attracted me to this space was that I do firmly believe that we're like in an interesting spot right now where we can really prove that like doing good and making money aren't mutually yeah. exclusive constructs. I was listening to your Green Pill podcast. For whoever hasn't listened to that, you definitely should. That was a great episode. And there was a really good line in there that I had to write down because I felt like it summed it up so well. He said, blockchain has so much more to offer to capitalists trying to have an impact on the world. And it's so true. Like your ability to really hard code these principles of let's do good for the environment is super powerful. And what you're saying as well, Raphael, is like, we're at the really early stages of this community from a human perspective as well. So like, who are we bringing in here and what do yeah. they stand for? And what are the projects that they're building and the impact that that is going to have? 100%. Yeah. To finish it off, want to ask you, you know, what is your vision for the impact that you can, can have, you know, five, 10 years down the line, what would make you really happy? What would make me really happy is if we can scale permanent carbon removal, right? And we can really 
be the backbone that powers like this new wave of carbon markets? Because I really think the carbon market is going through a pretty crazy transition right now. And there's a lot of money and a lot of innovation taking place, which ultimately leads to chaos, right? Just everybody's doing their thing here and there. And I do believe that we need a kind of language to communicate, right? And this is, this is the thing that we want Tukin to build. It's just like, hey, look, here's an open infrastructure that you can use, you can leverage. And the upside is you can do your thing, you can do this other thing. And, you know, we all have different approaches on how we tackle the climate crisis, but at least all we do has a certain level of standardization to make sure that we can harness and we can drive that into, in, in the right directions. My long-term vision really is an open system, an open car- kind of system that is not only working for carbon markets, but for my- environmental markets in general, where Tukin is kind of a bit like, you know, w- one of the backbone infrastructures on which it's built, fully open, fully composable. So there's like other projects that are building tools like, you know, Solid World DAO is like going deep into like the forward finance uh, Atom and Senkin are building like marketplaces on top of it and like aggregators. And so I really think that the the composability of crypto here is our superpower. So if we can build a really diverse ecosystem of tools that are all interoperable, then this will be unbeatable. Uh, and ultimately, the thing that we measured at is like, how much money have we delivered to the best projects in the world to really scale their impact, right? So if we're just moving money around that doesn't result in like any positive change on the ground, then we fail. I think that this notion of interoperability also fits really well into the crisis that we're facing ourselves. Like climate change by virtue of it is super interoperable. Like, yes, it may be affecting different parts of the world in different ways right now, depending on how much money your government has or where you're situated in relation to the equator. But at the end of the day, it's something that affects us all. And we need to build together to tackle this problem. Raphael, thank you so much for coming on today. This was definitely a super informative episode for me. I hope for the listeners as well. Uh, Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, follow along with your journey, get involved with Toucan? What are the best spots to uh, keep in touch with you? You can find me on on Twitter at Rafa Benoit. So this is R-A-P-H-A-B-E-N-O-I. And uh, if that was too complicated, just go to toucan.earth, toucan like the bird. And there, you know, you can find us on like Discord, Twitter, and like other socials there's a blog there that you can use to like kind of smart up on the space and um as i said at the beginning i'll just reiterate like this this needs to be about like um the people building on toucan this needs to be about the bridge that we build between this like web3 space and the climate space and there's a lot of education there so this is really you know i think refi is a movement that has space for anyone um, because there's so much to do you get to use the most the coolest tech to work on the most important problem. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks for having me on the show. It was fun. Thank you so much for coming on and we will see you on the next episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Bye everyone. Guide you down.